Uh, let's move on to the next session. The next session uh, has two speakers. It's, uh, this session is about uh, the breakthrough, the recent machine learning breakthrough. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Kok Lei. Um, probably many of you have read his paper and uh, heard his results. Um, he, Kok was a graduate student, PhD student from Andrew Ng's group at Stanford. He co-founded the Google Brain back in 2011. And also, after that, he wrote the, uh, with Ilya together, wrote the famous paper on sequence to sequence learning that revolutionized um, basically natural language processing. But this year, Kok, um, actually starting from last year, they were working on something called the auto ML, auto automated machine learning. And that uh, actually is a very big breakthrough because now it becomes an industrial, um, very practical application. So we'll let Kok to tell you about that. Hi, everyone. My name is Kok, and um, uh, I'm a member of the Google Brain team, um, uh, part of Google AI. I, um, uh, uh, I have done machine learning for about 15 years, um, uh, around, started around 2003 and 2004. Uh, and in many projects that I worked on, um, I realized that uh, people have, um, uh, spent, even though it's machine learning for, uh, is uh, seem to be a very promising solution for many problems, people have spent a lot of time uh, on model tuning, model designing. Uh, so the current solution, uh, if you want to use machine learning, is the following. You have some data, you have some computation, uh, some GPUs, but then you need some uh, machine learning expertise. Uh, some people with machine learning knowledge to solve the problem. And uh, we believe that if we uh, can actually use uh, 100 times or 1,000 times more computation, then uh, we, can actually, uh, elim uh, we can actually eliminate, uh, help removing the need for a lot of machine learning expertise. So instead of hiring a lot of machine learning expertise or using a lot of machine learning expertise, we can scale our solution, solution to, for many pro companies. Um, so, uh, if you look closely in any machine learning, learning pipeline, you're going to see uh, uh, data coming in, and then uh, you're uh, going to do some data cleaning, data processing, and then you're going to apply machine learning. So, in this talk, I'm going to tell you some of our research or some of our updates uh, around um, uh, these two areas as well. So, we have solution to improve uh, how to build uh, model, uh, learning machine models uh, automatically and also have uh, ways to automate the data processing. Um, so first start with uh, machine learning models. Uh, so um, uh, I've been, uh, so one of the areas of machine learning that I, I work a lot on is uh, computer vision. So in fact, like uh, my PhD thesis was around machine, uh, uh, around computer vision. So in computer vision, there's this uh, uh, famous data set called ImageNet. And over the years, we start, uh, uh, since 2012, since AlexNet coming out, you see a lot of progress in this data set. So going from 55% to around 80% uh, top one error. And if you look through, uh, in, uh, in this data set, the, actually the validation data set that people use to bench, uh, benchmark the models is the same. So what's happening here that you see the progress from 55% to 80% is actually just the modeling. So you, you, if you do your modeling better, you get uh, you know, 25% uh, gain in accuracy. And now the problem is that uh, currently there are very few people who can do uh, this job, like trying to actually get a, a model and then trying to improve it. Um, uh, so the question, my research question uh, around 2016, 2017 was how can we design, uh, how can we design uh, good architectures automatically? Now, uh, for, uh, to, to just give you an example of what a good architecture looks like. So this is the famous paper by uh, Alex Krzyzewski called AlexNet. Uh, so uh, the image coming in uh, around 224, 224 images, uh, uh, size, and then you apply some filter uh, 11 by 11, and then uh, you go through a sequence of layers of uh, convolution, max pooling, 
uh, and then uh, fully connected layers, and then the, the final submax layer. And when you look at this architecture, there's a lot of numbers in that. And you ask yourself, why are these, all these numbers? And the types of layer, like why max pooling is the second layer, why is not fully connected network there? So there's a lot of questions, but nobody knows. Um, uh, so uh, we, uh, the after, uh, we developed something called neural architecture search to, uh, with an attempt to automate the, the problem of designing architectures. So uh, our key insight is that uh, every architecture, no matter how complicated it is, is basically a string. It's like a little computer program, right? Uh, so uh, that's basically, if you use TensorFlow, that's a little TensorFlow program. If you use Py PyTorch, that's a little PyTorch program. So we're gonna, our goal is we're gonna use an INN to generate that program. And then that program will be scored uh, by how well it works on your data set. Well, sometimes it doesn't compile, so you get a reward of zero. Sometimes you get, uh, it compiles and it works, you get a reward of seven, uh, like, you know, 70%. And sometimes you get lucky, you get 80%. Now the, the controller will notice which program works better, so that later on it will learn that it's actually generate more programs that look like the 80% program rather than the 0% program. So the picture look like this. So you have a controller which proposed uh, many uh, children networks, and the children network will be trained and evaluated on your data set that you care about. And then uh, some models will get 75%, some models will get 69%, and some models will get 97%. Uh, and the, the, the feedback from the child model is gonna send back to the controller, and the controller will learn to propose next generation of child models. So, Imagine you train your uh, convolutional network, uh, but uh, the con when you train the controller, every iteration will take hours to train, right? Because the train and evaluate of a single child model will be um, many hours. So this is basically the best way to use as many GPUs as possible at Google. Um, so uh, uh, in, um, um, uh, in our research, we actually have started uh, uh, with uh, reinforcement learning, but recently we also work on using evolution uh, um, search methods as well. And they both uh, have uh, advantages and disadvantages, and they both, in some cases, they all work very well. Uh, so I just wanna focus on uh, using reinforcement learning because it's uh, a kind of intuitive for many people. Uh, so uh, if, if you want to use a controller INN to generate the, um, Architecture, so uh, if you think about the architecture, it's like a string. Here's a string that you can generate. You first generate the number of filters, uh, the filter height, the filter width, the stripe height, stripe width, you know, layer type, et cetera, and then you generate this string. And then on the uh, uh, um, worker side, you have a, an interpreter that look at this program and say, let's try to reconstruct a program that look this way. So. Uh, in an essence, we, uh, we create like a domain-specific language that actually the controller generate the program. Um, and then uh, when we try, first uh, we try this on uh, CIFAR 10 data set. Um, this this CIFAR 10 data set is probably the most benchmark data set in computer vision, uh, in uh, machine learning and computer vision. Uh, so it started around 2010, uh, and many people have worked on it. And the, uh, the error rate over time, uh, uh, improves. So when we started out this project, we say the best that we could achieve is around 90%. Uh, but uh, this method, for some reason, is actually generating an architecture that only get 5% uh, um, error, which is uh, on par with the state of the art of human-generated architectures. And these are basically many, many years of work by many experts in computer vision and machine learning. Uh, so. Um, now, uh, after CIFAR 10, uh, we uh, benchmark our method on ImageNet. So on ImageNet is probably considered the holy grail of computer vision. Uh, so in, this, uh, in these two figures, I'm gonna plot you, um, uh, uh, show you um, uh, the accuracy on the y-axis uh, versus the uh, size of the model on the x-axis. There are two figures here, but maybe you can just uh, focus on the figure on the left, right? So this is a very 
conventional way to compare models on ImageNet. So accuracy alone is not enough. You need to measure the accuracy against um, uh, model size as well, and because bigger models tend to work better. And uh, so uh, the, if you can see, the, the, the black line is the frontier uh, um, models of uh, human design networks, right? And uh, uh, in this plot, we want the, the result to be on the top left corner of the figure. And as you can see, uh, the NASNet, which is basically generated by AutoML, was able to actually improve significantly over the frontier of human design networks. So this is, um, uh, this is basically uh, news, um, the models uh, since last year. Um, so this year we also work on the next generation of models and we're gonna show you, uh, uh, in the next few months we're gonna show you even the better frontiers uh, of AutoML models. Um, so uh, the models that we generate, they tend to uh, work well um, when you uh, run it on uh, GPU or TPUs, but uh, in a lot of applications at Google, we want to be, uh, to be able to run on mobile phones. Now, on mobile phones, we, uh, so, uh, some chips are implemented a little bit differently, so we want to actually be able to measure the time uh, it takes to, to do inference on uh, the mobile phones. So we develop a framework where uh, not only we use uh, just the accu accuracy as the reward metric, but also the time. Uh, so uh, in our framework, we, the controller will sample a bunch of models, and then it will be trained and evaluated. And then uh, once it's done training and evaluation, it will send to a mobile farm to measure the time it takes to do inference for a single image. Uh, and then it will combine accuracy and latency uh, so, you know, you know it take uh, accuracy and divide by the latency and then combine it as a, the reward signal. So the reward and the signal will have both accuracy and latency. And uh, um, so we compare against our, what called the MobileNet V2 uh, developed at Google. So MobileNet V2 is the current state of the art. If you want to use uh, models for mobile phone, this is MobileNet V2 is the, the go-to model. And AutoML was able to generate a model with a different time uh, latency, it actually beat uh, MobileNet V2 uh, by a significant margin. So as you can see, you know, two, three percent uh, in the uh, uh, accuracy. Um, so if you, um, model architecture is only one aspect of uh, the modeling. Um, you can use uh, this framework to actually automate the other components of the network, for example, the optimization algorithm or the nonlinearity of the um, uh, of the uh, network. So the nonlinearity, in a sense, it basically uh, the, how you describe it is also an equation. You know, sigmoid is an equation, uh, Drelu is an equation. So we actually use this method to search for a new activation function. Uh, so, uh, and um, this method discover a new activation function that looks like this, x multiplied by sigmoid of x. So you might look at that equation and you say, what, 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 what does it mean? It turns out the equation looks almost exactly like a sigmoid, right? The shape of it is very much like sigmoid, except that it actually have a little bump near zero. Uh, so compared to sigmoid, uh, sorry, uh, compared to ReLU, that's what it looks like. So very similar to the ReLU. And we call this activation function switch. Um, and right now, uh, at the moment, a lot of people uh, use this switch activation function for a lot of training in uh, GAN and uh, uh, reinforcement learning because uh, it's kind of more stable. And a lot of products at Google are actually using this activation function already. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, in summary, basically, it's very much like ReLU, except for you have a strange hump near zero. And it's a smooth function, unlike ReLU, where it's actually uh, discon uh, discontinued. Um, and, um, there's a, like a, a non-differentiable point near zero. Um, so, um, 
Uh, we compare this switch activation function uh, against a range of activation function, and here's one example. Uh, on NASNet A, it's actually uh, outperformed uh, the ReLU activation function by uh, more than 1%. Um, so, so far I talked about uh, just the uh, machine learning mod uh, model, how to use, uh, uh, use AutoML to design better machine learning model, design better um, activation function, uh, but you can use AutoML to um, actually get better uh, data processing. So here's an example. So um, uh, a, a very important component when you train your um, uh, convolutional nets for image classification is that um, uh, you need to do data augmentation. So if you take whatever rest net, your favorite uh, training, and then you disable data augmentation, you lose about 8%. Accuracy. So this is show you how important it is, right? And uh, the key idea about data augmentation is to generate more data. So you take a cat image and then you rotate it a little bit, translate it a little bit, and etc. And zoom out a little bit so that you have more examples of the same uh, object. Uh, so since that you, uh, we use a, uh, the previous frame framework to actually generate uh, nonlinearity and architecture. You can also use it to generate a better data augmentation strategy. So, a strategy should, in our framework, uh, consist of um, um, uh, three uh, values. First of all, is basically a image processing function. Let's say that's equalize or rotate. And then uh, the magnitude of the uh, that we're going to apply this um, uh, of, the, uh, of the function, and then the probability that we're gonna use that. For example, sometimes we don't wanna use it a lot, so you wanna just use 0 0.4, uh, pro uh, probabi with pro probability of 0 0.4. So, um, uh, and then we're gonna use the um, controller to generate these policies. And this policy is gonna be tried on a fixed network, right? And uh, and then which policy do better, we're gonna uh, use it to, um, to, to finally train the better network. Um, so on uh, CIFA 10, uh, the state of the art, uh, after so many years, uh, people got 2.1% uh, error, and auto augment the method that I just told you, uh, got, uh, uh, is the first method ever that got uh, beyond the barrier of 2% error. It got 1.5% error. On ImageNet, the state of the art is 3.9% error. This is the absolute best. And uh, auto augment got 3.5% uh, error. Um, so a significant improvement uh, in the top five. This is, any improvement in this, this area is very difficult. So uh, let, let me give you a quick summary of all the progress. So uh, again, I wanna tell you that like, um, uh, in AutoML, we have a machine learning model to learn how to generate machine learning models, right? And this basically, uh, through trial and error, it's gonna improve itself, and it's gonna ge generate better and better machine learning models over time. Uh, I wanna give you a quick summary of the progress in uh, two data sets, which is CIFA 10 and ImageNet. So on CIFA 10, uh, on, uh, so th this is the progress in accuracy over time. And uh, before AutoML, uh, um, uh, uh, before we started AutoML, most of the model are generated by human experts. And after AutoML, on the right side, you started all the state of the mo art models will actually have something to do with AutoML. Uh, the three, top three uh, state of the art models are actually AutoML. Now on ImageNet, uh, same story, like before AutoML, uh, we have a lot of state-of-the-art human design models, but the top three models in ImageNet uh, are generated by AutoML. Uh, so, uh, so far I've been talking a lot about computer vision because in computer vision, there's a lot of effort going to designing models. Uh, but uh, uh, the same principle and the same uh, algorithm can be used uh, to other areas too. So, uh, we've been working, uh, uh, working on using AutoML for NLP um, and uh, um, structure prediction and so on, and uh, uh, we have all success there. Uh, a lot of the research that I told you 
uh, in this talk already been implemented and deployed in at Google uh, Cloud. So uh, if you have a data set and uh, you don't know how to do modeling, uh, this technique will generate, you, generate a good model for you that uh, uh, can be uh, on par with the state of the art uh, if you want. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, so if you're interested in more about the research behind this, uh, here's a list of papers uh, that you can uh, take a look. And uh, I can stop here and take questions. Thank you. Now we're opening up for questions. I see a lot of hands going up, and uh, our, our volunteer will come to you. Uh, maybe the start from first row. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I, I just have a quick question. Is AutoML uh, open sourced at all? Uh, pardon? Uh, have you open sourced any of your work? Uh, so uh, we are making some attempts at open source, uh, some aspect of this, but because the implementation is so tied to uh, Google infrastructure, it's very hard to open source. But I think people open source something like uh, so one of my interns uh, imports uh, open source something called ENAS, so efficient neural architecture search. So it's uh, very efficient. So with a single uh, GPUs, in a few days, you can get good results. They're not state of the art, but they're good results. Um, uh, some people also open source auto keras, and uh, the results are also quite good there as well. So right. yeah, there's some ver implementation are, are in open source, yes. Okay, I'm from a, a Korean e-commerce company called Coupang. Mm. I implemented one version of NOS uh, mm. you, in your paper. So I have, I could be wrong, but I have little worry about that. Feel like there's a concern of like overfeeding. It's kind of training on the validation set, right? So I, I don't know, how do you think about that problem? Like, do you have any tricks to? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, we're also nervous that uh, the, some of the architectures that we generated kind of overfitted to ImageNet. So, uh, or, um, so we actually work, together, work with uh, another uh, um, resident of mine named Simon. And the idea is that uh, can we take some of those? So the real test is transfer learning. Can we take some of those networks and improve all the data set as well? Uh, for example, like Stanford cars, flowers, and et cetera, and the answer is yes. It turns out the better networks that you found on ImageNet general, generalize to all the data sets. So yeah, the answer is yes. We, uh, the, the, networks, we, um, the networks work really well on all the data sets too, not just ImageNet. Hi, Kwok, great presentation. Sure. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Um, so over the time, the state-of-the-art research has led into different kind of network topologies like in ResNet, escaping network connections, and in ImageNet, inception net like network within network. Mm. Does AutoML also allow to do these kind of new exploratory topological changes, or does it just change across the current topology? And if that is so, then how do you add new advancement to the search area of AutoML? I see. Uh, so the... Um uh, I guess that uh, how, uh, right now, um, it depends on the search space, really. So the, if you, uh, in our search space, we assume a lot of existing building blocks, right? You know, COM 3x3, three three, COM 5x5, five five, you know, skip connection and so on. And the job of AutoML is basically uh, taking a lot of these existing blocks and compose them, right? And it turns out that even with that, um, it already make a lot of gains. Uh, in accuracy and so on. Uh, now, uh, if we go deeper, so let's say every building block, we're gonna just open it up and then allow AutoML to actually modify them. I guess that it will be able to do something more complicated. But the cost to that approach is that it's gonna be a lot more expensive. So right now we work on the trade-off, right? Like just taking the existing uh, uh, components and compose them. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we're looking into like making it a little bit more uh, fine-grained so that you can find things like skip connections and things like that. Yeah, but so far, not yet. Okay, last question. Um, back to the question about overfitting. I would imagine there's a sort of hyperparameter that has to do with regularization or pushing the network to do well with fewer parameters, fewer connections, and so forth. So have you tried 
playing with that to reduce the likelihood of overfitting, make it more costly to use more connections, more parameters? Uh, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, um, we, um, it turns out that uh, what you just said is uh, true, but like, there's something uh, kind of implicit. So uh, I talked to you about, uh, first of all, I talked to you about NASNet, and that is actually better, have a better frontier compared to um, human design models. So, in, uh, uh, so we recently worked on something called uh, MNASNet, which is basically a mobile-friendly version of NASNet. And in mobile, uh, in when we do the we do the mobile search, right? We are, what we did was we want, want to make sure the model is actually quite small, and uh, it kind of find models that tend to be small because small is better for mobile phones. And it turns out that magically, when we take that model and then scale it in many different ways, it's actually also better than NASNet itself. So uh, implicit, but it's actually kind of doing better. Uh, like, like the way you say, yeah. Great, thanks to Sanko Kolk yeah. for his presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Samit Guwani. Samit is a, a partner research manager at Microsoft, and he's the inventor of FlashFill uh, feature in the Excel, and he's leading a lot of um, automating the programming behind the Excel function that many of you start to realize. Actually, I was surprised by how smart Excel has become. So let's uh, welcome Summit. Hello, everyone. So I'll start with a story that inspired this line of work. Nine years ago, I was returning from a conference in an airplane, and there was a lady sitting next to me who was very impressed to know that I'm a PhD in computer science and that I work for Microsoft Research. So I ought to help her with the task that she was struggling with. She opens up her laptop, fires up Excel, shows me a column of strings that she wants to map to a different format. She gives me a couple of examples to explain her intent, and then asks me for a program that can do the transformation. Now, at that time, I had to excuse myself out of the situation because I had no idea about the programming model underneath Excel. But after I got back home, I tried to search for a solution to that problem. And it is then when I observed that there were many, many people who were struggling with simple tasks like those. So here is how an, such an interaction went on at Help Forum. So an end user would ask an expert to give them a program that can translate the string on the left side of the arrow to the right side. Now the expert looks at this and sends them back a program which extracts two characters starting from the fifth character. The user takes this program and runs it on the data set and figures out that it does not do the right job on a, another input that they have, and they send a second input output example to the expert. So what do you think is the end user trying to do here? So extract the substring between the first two occurrences of underscore. How many of you know how to program this in Excel? This is one of the simplest formulas that will do the job for you. <laughs> the end user takes this, runs this, and is happy, and sends a thank you to the expert. Now this inspired me to develop a technology that can automate the role of this expert on the help forum and can automatically generate such programs from a couple of examples. And this led to this feature called FlashFill, which shipped in Excel 2013. And let me quickly show you a demo of this technology. So suppose you have a bunch of strings in the first column, a bunch of numbers, and you want to format them by inserting hyphens and masking off some digits. Of course, a principal way to do this is to write an Excel formula. But 99% people who use spreadsheets do not know programming, and they'll be stuck and they'll have to do this manually. But now, thanks to FlashFill, you can give an example of what you want and press Control-E to fire this feature. And when you do that, the system takes the input-output example, generalizes it into a program, and runs that program on the rest of the data to automate the task for you. The Excel team did quite a good job at avoiding the so-called discoverability issue. So here I'm trying to extract the last name from an email address. And suppose I don't know that this feature exists. 
The moment I start doing the second row, the system auto fires. It realizes that the column that I'm trying to create is not an arbitrary column, but a derivation of the input column, and it fires itself. And then you can simply press enter to accept the results. Now, in general, it's too good to read the mind of the user from just one example, as this scenario illustrates. I have a bunch of medical billing codes. Suppose I want to insert a right bracket wherever right bracket is missing. Then if I give one example to the tool, the tool comes up with the simplest generalization, which is to add a right bracket everywhere. Maybe this is what you want to do, and then you are done. But if you really wanted to add a right bracket wherever it was missing, you will observe that row six to row 10 are incorrect. So you can fix any one of these rows, like row eight, which is like giving a second input output example to the tool. And now when I hit enter, the tool is able to better generalize to the intent that I had in mind. The tool is very useful for extracting things like substrings or fields from large strings. Even if you're a programmer, thinking of the logic will take you a lot of time. But now all that you have to do is to give an example and press Control E to automate the task for you. The tool can synthesize quite complicated programs, in particular programs that contain loops from just one example in this case. I may be using lowercase, I may not put spaces, I can do periods and it will all work. So now let's say I have a column of names and if I specify J in the column B, what do you think I'm trying to do here? Extract the first letter, right? And that's what the tool thinks. What about this? Extract the first two letters, and this is exactly what the tool thinks, right? And here are the first three letters. Now suppose if you didn't observe me doing these three first columns, what is your most reasonable guess as to what I'm trying to do in column E? Extract the first name, right? And this is exactly what the tool thinks as well. But if you really wanted the first four characters, you can give one more example, and then the tool will be able to give you the first four characters. So my favorite is this one, where I'm trying to compute initials. But the tool is smart enough to figure out that the lowercase f in j dot f dot is the lower casing of the capital F in Foster, and not the other small f's that occur inside Jeff. And this scenario just works with one example. So what this really shows is that the tool is quite good at so-called ranking of these programs. Because when you give examples, examples are very ambiguous. There are many, many interpretations of those examples, but the tool does quite a good job at ranking these interpretations and giving you uh, what you need. Now, there are also many tasks which the tool will not be able to do. So one thing that we tried to do when we ship out this feature was to see what other classes of tasks were people trying to do that we did not support besides string transformations. And this is here where we observed that people were trying to do things like number transformations or daytime transformations. So think about a task as simple as rounding off a number to two decimal places. If you have to program this in Excel and C Sharp, you need to remember this format descriptor. In case of Python or C, you have to remember a different format descriptor, and so on. But again, examples can serve as a very natural way to specify your intention even for tasks like these. Here's another example where the user wants to extract the red date and map it to the corresponding weekday. They want to extract the green time and bucketize it into a three-hour bucket. And these kinds of features are often done by data scientists who might have to write an arbitrary amount of code, a huge amount of code, in order to extract such simple features like this. But the new version of Flashfill, which ships as part of Azure Machine Learning Workbench, can do this task from simply one example. Recently, I came across a blog post by a data scientist who was interviewing for a company, and he described his experiences in that blog post. He was asked to code up FizzBuzz, and he was very offended at that. He proceeded by training a deep neural network to solve that task. Of course, he didn't get the job, and his deep neural network also didn't work, even after he gave so many examples. So while I admire his intent in trying to think creatively to avoid doing repetitive tasks or mundane tasks like these, he was using the wrong tool. Instead of training a deep neural network, he should have used programming by examples. So I showed you that programming by examples is a great fit for doing map operations. What other operations can it be good for? How about filter operations? So this is a challenge taken from a data science class run by Brown University. The students are asked to take this text file and extract structured data out of it, a CSV file. And in this case, the instructor provides them a script to build on top of. The goal is to take this script, build on top of it, and go from left to right. Now let me show you what would a programming by example experience would look like for these kinds of tasks. 
So I've loaded the same file here. And all that you have to do is to give one to two examples of the various fields that you're interested in. So for instance, you want to extract the championship name. You give an example. And then the moment you give another example, the system starts learning. And in this case, comes up with a program which can extract other such instances from the document. If you want to extract other fields, you simply change the color of the highlighter. And here, giving one example suffices because my previous interaction has started to put some structure on the document. I can go ahead and extract such as the score. Now, in this case, the tool does not get it right from one example. I can give more examples. In fact, one more example in the third record, and the system will get it right. But what if this error occurred somewhere down in the middle of your big data? If you are a programmer programming these kinds of things yourself, the correctness of your program simply is this rests in your own hands. But here, since you're not committing to a specific implementation, you're programming by intent, we can do many other magical things as well. In particular, if you go to the disambiguation tab, the system will tell you exactly where it is confused and where user's intervention may possibly be needed. So it tells you that the third record is a little bit ambiguous and different from rest of the data. And now you can give another example, and the system will extract the right stuff uh, for you. Now, besides transforming or doing manipulation on big strings or small strings, what else can we do with programming by examples? Well, how about transforming tables as an entity themselves? So it turns out that when you have spreadsheets, you tend to lock the data along with the visualization that it is in, and it becomes very difficult to change the layout. If you want to do some kind of analysis, it's a very similar tricky situation. Now, again, this is a capability, uh, this is a task that can be eased using programming by examples. So you can simply give one to two examples of various entries in the output table, and the system can come up with a program which can go from left to right. 50% of spreadsheets are semi-structured, and companies like KPMG and Deloitte hires thousands of people to translate these semi-structured, huge, gigantic financial spreadsheets into something more structured that they can easily do analysis on. So let me quickly show you a peek into a prototype technology for this kind of scenario. So here I have a list of top-sided authors for conference Popple 2015, and this kind of information repeats itself for different conference editions. Suppose I want to figure out who is the most cited author across all of these conference editions. So if all of this data was in some table, then I can easily write a SQL query, or we can use our programming by natural language technology in order to answer such questions. But the problem is that this data is not in a proper table. So now you tell our tool that you want to create a table with three columns. The names of these columns don't really matter. And you simply give examples of what should be this in this output table. So here I've given an example of one tuple. And now I will give an example of another tuple down below to make it more representative to the tool as to what I'm trying to do. And now the tool is able to learn a program from just two examples, which can extract other such tuples from this spreadsheet. So now let me give you a quick peek into how this technology actually works. So the heart of it is a search engine which tries to search for programs that satisfy the input-output examples that the user has provided. So this search does not happen over a pre-existing database of programs, but this search happens over the infinite space of programs defined by an underlying programming language. Now, if I were to search over an arbitrary Turing-complete programming language like C or C Sharp, the search may not be as real-time as you noticed. So the first trick that we use is that instead of trying to search over an arbitrary programming language, we search over a domain-specific language which is specific to each of the domains for which we have implemented this technology. This domain-specific language, even being much restricted in a general purpose language, is still infinite. So if you were to do a naive search over this language, like brute force search, it's not going to scale. So we use logical reasoning techniques to be able to efficiently search over this domain-specific language for programs that satisfy the input-output examples that the user has provided. And the way this search proceeds is by pushing the input-output examples down the structure of the grammar in a sense, a little bit similar to how backpropagation in machine learning works, except that we are reasoning with very complicated operators in a programming language. So in case of flash fill, the underlying domain-specific language contains regular expressions, substring, concatenate, some limited form of conditionals, and so on. And then we use many heuristics to guide the search, and recently the work that we have done is to use machine learning in order to automatically learn such kinds of heuristics. 
So it is a combination of logical reasoning techniques and machine learning techniques which makes this experience very effective, real time, and identifying the right program from just one or two examples. The output of the search engine is a set of programs that are consistent with the examples that the user has provided. The number of these programs is huge, often 10 to the power 50. But of course, we don't compute this and represent these programs explicitly. We use efficient data structures to compute and represent these programs. And now the second challenge is to pick one program out of these 10 to the power 50 programs, each of which matches with the examples in order to present the results to the user. And here is where we use program ranking. And this ranking is based upon features of the program. So we normally prefer programs that are shorter. We prefer programs that use fewer constants. But we also look at the execution results of these programs on the input data that the user has. So if one program ends up producing all dates and one program ends up producing some dates and some gibberish, we prefer the former program. And then since this is really about programming, it is going to be an incomplete experience if you don't provide any kind of debuggability experience. And this has to be a very in integral part of such technologies. And this is where you saw the experience in extracting data from log files where the system was able to point out the records which were looking different from the records on which I had given examples. And again, we use a few different classes of techniques uh, to build this disambiguation utility. And then once the system is satisfied and the user is satisfied that they have probably learned the right program, that program is generated in this domain-specific uh, language D and can be used to complete the task uh, for the user. Now, before I conclude, I wanted to actually point out and show you one demo about some of the recent advances that we have made in this area. So you saw this demo on FlashFill where we were able to learn programs from just one or two examples. So the first prototype that I built for Excel, which took me three weeks and it was 5,000 lines of code, uh, used to require three to four examples per task. And the Excel team told me, there is no way that they can ship this technology because when the user would give one example on simple tasks, it will come up with funny results and users would lose confidence in the capability or trust with this tool. And they were quite right. Uh, so I worked hard to make this technology work with one or two examples on more simple tasks. Recently, I was challenged, can we do even better? Well, how much better can you do than one example for a given task? What about zero examples? Okay. So it turns out that there are some domains where this is actually very important. So think about the case of log files. Giving examples of various fields is, of course, much better than writing a parser. But what if you have tens and hundreds of fields? Giving one to two examples of each of these fields will be very painful. And if the structure is clear to a human being, then you can actually ask the question, can you automatically learn a parser for this log file by simply looking at the log file? And that's what we ended up doing. And I'll show you a quick demo of uh, this capability soon. And we call this predictive synthesis. And the other advance that we've been working on is to actually show this program that we are learning to the user in a readable, editable format in a language of user's choice so that they can actually integrate it with their workflows. Because data scientists don't like magic. They want full transparency into what is happening uh, underneath. So let me show you these two innovations combined together in the context of um, uh, a Jupyter Notebook uh, uh, demo. So what I have here is a text file that contains 911 call records. At the top, there is some metadata. Then there's a header row. And then each row contains a single 911 call record entry. We asked a bunch of Python programmers to do some analysis over this file. In particular, figure out when are 911 calls most common. Is it on Monday mornings or Friday afternoons and so on? The Python programmers took 30 minutes on average to complete this task. And with the automated programming APIs, I can complete this task in less than a minute. So let me show you how. So the first step in dealing with this file is to ingest this data into a tabular form so that I can then start cleaning columns or transforming columns or doing some analysis over it. So I showed you this capability for parsing a log file into tables by giving examples. But in such relatively simple cases, we can do this task completely automatically without requiring any, any further examples from the user. So the user simply invokes our API to read this file and there are no examples that have been provided here because this is a relatively simple file. And the tool ends up generating code that can convert this file into a data frame. Now, this is PySpark code. So let's say you're a Python programmer. You might be familiar with Pandas API, but if you have to run your 
a code on big data, you might want to generate PySpark code. Then you'll have to go to Stack Overflow, figure out what the right set of APIs are, and spend a lot of time trying to discover the right thing. And also note that, look at the first part of this code that has been generated, and this automation is very useful because it is saving you time that is linear in the width of the file. If you have hundreds of fields to extract, you'll have to write hundreds of statements like this. But now all of this is completely automatically generated for you. So you can execute this code in the notebook to populate this data frame, which looks like this. Now look at the description column. So what I want to do is to extract the date and time out of this description column and map it into the corresponding weekday and the bucket that it belongs to, whether it's morning or afternoon and so on. And this is something that I can do by from simply one example. And this is the same thing that I was showing you earlier in a GUI mode. But in a coding environment, this is how it would look like. So I call this flash fill API in this programmatic mode. I'm giving it one input output example. And just from one example, it is able to generate readable, modifiable Python code, which you can just copy and paste in your notebook and execute it to generate a new column. If you want, you can change the number three into five or six if you want to create a five-hour bucket or a six-hour bucket, and the code would work just fine. So when I execute this code, I'm able to drive this new column at the end, and all that I have to do is to simply press the visualization button to figure out that most 911 uh, calls actually happens on Thursdays, 3 p.m. to uh, 6 p.m. Yeah. So now before my concluding slide, I'll just point out one other class of applications that is very amenable to programming by examples. So all the scenarios that I showed you were in this category of what is called data transformations. So think about code transformations. So if you have any application migration scenario, you might want to migrate your code from old version to new version or from one framework to another framework. Uh, developers end up spending 40% of their time doing repetitive code transformations. But again, this is some scenario where they can simply give an example of two of the changes they want to make, and the system can automatically suggest to them all the places in the code where such changes need to be made. Uh, similarly, for custom formatting or trying to do repetitive edits if you are trying to do some bug fixes or some performance enhancements. A very intriguing application of using this kind of technology to suggest fixes to developers is also very useful in the education world where the system can watch the edits that teachers are making uh, to assignments submitted by students, and then they can intelligently pass on similar edits as feedback to other students who have made similar class of uh, errors. I won't have time to go more into this kind of connection, but the higher level bit is that if you start creating personalized assistants that can help you be more productive, which is what this talk was about, the same kind of assistants deployed in reverse can be very useful in teaching and education world. But I'll actually now move on to my concluding slide here. Um, so programming by examples is a new frontier in AI. And the technology has already matured to the point where it can provide 10 to 100x productivity increase to developers in some narrow task domains. But to me, even the more exciting fact here is that this kind of technology is starting to enable non-programmers to program computers. 99% of computer users do not know programming, and being enabled with tools like this, they can be much more creative in terms of automating their repetitive tasks in their lives. I talked about two killer applications, data cleaning and code refactoring. I think programming robots, you know, when robots become household entities, these kinds of technologies will also play a huge role there. So the underlying techniques that we use to make these technologies, build these technologies, combine logical reasoning techniques from the first wave of AI, which is kind of a little bit forgotten today, but that's what we use, and machine learning, which is the current revolution that is going on. And I believe a lot more disruption is going to happen when we start integrating these two styles of reasoning together. So if you look at the history of programming, we went from punch cards and low-level assembly language to high-level languages and beautiful code editors. The next evolution, I believe, will take programming closer to natural human communication, where it will be very multimodal through use of examples and natural language. Today, examples are already present in the programming experience in the form of test cases. Natural language is already present in coding in the form of comments, but these artifacts will become first-class citizens during the code authoring process as we go forward. Thank you. We have a time for one or two questions. So, so Google has a similar feature on Google spreadsheets that you can actually do not provide any examples. Tell the program that draw a pivot table 
based on the column of like SKU and item prices, and it, it detects where those informations are available. So does uh, Microsoft Excel has similar features so that- So let me understand what feature are you talking about? Are you talking about Google Explore or? Yes, Google Explore. Okay. Yes. So Google Explore is a beautiful program synthesis technology that generates programs from natural language based intent. There are some tasks where examples are a better fit. There are some tasks where natural language is a better fit. So human communication, I believe there are three important aspects there. Examples, language, and uh, sequencing. So when you teach a child, you know, you give lots of examples as well, but you also deal with language. So today, most of the advances in the machine learning area have focused more on understanding language. And in this talk, what I focused on was more about dealing with examples. I think the future would really involve combining these forms of intents together in a multimodal experience uh, for the users. So if, for example, let's say you want to compute the average of positive numbers in a list. Now, giving examples may not be very meaningful because if you give me an example, you have done the task yourself or you have to go and artificially create a small example and representative example for me. But natural language would be a better fit. So it really depends on what is the best way to express your intent as naturally as you would to a human being. And we ought to build technologies that can take that kind of intent and generate programs from that. Uh, last question. Yeah, hi, Sumit. Uh, absolutely wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. I was just wondering, the, just the way you're doing it for Excel, are you also doing it for PowerPoint? Uh, we did have a research paper that worked on learning scripts to automate repetitive PowerPoint edits. And you're absolutely right that there are huge amounts of productivity gains to be obtained by learning these programs from repetitive uh, tasks, which do not just span Excel. Excel was an example that I happened to pick. But if you look at a wide variety of applications that people use in the enterprise or for their personal use, there are many, many repetitive tasks. And this is where things get start getting mundane. All those are opportunities for us to start redefining the programmability experience by building technologies like this. So, one, so we have built around uh, between 10 to 20 such technologies. But the thing that, that did not probably come across as clearly was if you looked at the architecture slide that I talked about, earlier we would spend many, many years trying to build one such technology. But now what we have built is a synthesizer for program synthesizers, much like AutoML, where our general framework makes it easy for us to create a new solution for other researchers in the team today. But my hope is we want to take the technology to a level where advanced developers, not even research scientists, can start redefining the programming experience themselves by using our common toolkit for PowerPoint, for Word, uh, for uh, Google products, or uh, anywhere where there is an uh, option of repetitive tasks and programmability. Great. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Our next speaker, let me introduce next speaker, um, Roger Robert from McKinsey. And he's uh, been McKinsey for many years to start it.